Hey, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. So we're going to get our program underway. It's great to be here in person with you today. And you know, this is our first time back at the St. Regis since February of 2020. You can believe that. Yeah, hey, yeah, we're back, we're back. So we're happy to see you and be back together with you again today. And thank you for joining us. And please continue eating your lunch as we get our program underway. We had to start a little earlier to accommodate our speaker's travel schedule and a train that she has to cast to New York this afternoon. So thank you for your flexibility. But I would invite you after our speaker leaves, you can stay, work on your coffee and dessert, and just stay and socialize. So we'll have a little more social time on the back end of today's program. You know, I'm Rick Kapler, president of the Media Institute, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our Communications Forum Luncheon for September. And we have a very informative and entertaining program for you today with financial analyst Laura Martin. But before we start, I'd like to tell you about a couple of event events coming up. Most of you probably know that our Free Speech America Gala is rapidly approaching and will take place in virtual format on Wednesday, October 19th. Hope you have your calendars marked for that already. We have a terrific gala program this year. Uh, our Freedom of Speech Award recipient will be Lester Holt, the anchor and managing editor of NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt and anchor of Dateline NBC. And presenting the award to Lester will be veteran journalist Harry Smith, who currently serves as a correspondent for NBC News. Our American Horizon Award recipient will be Ken Burns, the legendary filmmaker who has been producing award-winning documentaries for more than 40 years. And Ken is known for his films like The Civil War, Jazz, and Baseball on PBS. And in fact, his latest film, The U.S. and the Holocaust, has been debuting this week on PBS. And the third and final episode will be airing this evening. That's a terrific film. I recommend that to you very highly. And Ken's award will be presented by our good friend Pat Butler, the president and CEO of America's public television stations. Our featured speaker will be FCC Commissioner Nathan Symington, and of course, the master of ceremonies will be our own Dick Wiley. Hey, hey, Dick. I want to thank all of you who have signed up to be gala sponsors already. And if you haven't signed up yet, there's still time, but please don't delay. Uh, you can check out the details on our website or just email Susanna and she'll be happy to help you out. And finally, we'll be holding our last communications forum luncheon of the season in November. We're still working to confirm the details, but we'll let you know as soon as everything is set. And speaking of seasons, I know this is budget season for many of you, so I hope you'll keep the Media Insti Institute in your budget for 2023. We'll be back with a communications forum luncheon series early next year the Free Speech America Gala next fall, and of course, we depend on operating support as well. So please keep us in mind for all three of those categories as you work on your budgets in the weeks ahead. We have a special guest with us today. In addition to our distinguished speaker, Laura Martin, we've asked one of our good friends to introduce Laura. Many of you know Adonis Hoffman, who is a trustee of the Media Institute and serves on our First Amendment Advisory Council. Adonis has had a distinguished career serving as counsel and senior vice president of the American Association of Advertising Agencies, an adjunct professor at Georgetown University, and senior legal advisor to FCC Commissioner Mignon Clyburn. Currently, he's an executive and principal at the Advisory Council, LLC. Adonis is also the author of a brand new special report titled The New Rules of Media Measurement, a critical review of audience and media measurement today, which I highly recommend to you. You can find out more about this special report and how to obtain it on the Media Institute's website. Just go to our Digital Media Center page on our main site. And let me say that we're thrilled to have Laura Martin joining us all the way from California. Thank you, Laura, for making that trip to be with us today. And now to introduce our distinguished speaker, let me call on our longtime friend and colleague, Adonis Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So good to see everybody in person. You all look wonderful. Uh, our guest speaker today is a very distinguished, uh, a very distinguished um, foundation in the finance and um, 
telecom and media world. Laura Martin received her BA from Stanford, her MBA from Harvard Business School. She holds the Chartered Financial Analyst, CFA, and Chartered Market Technician designation, designation. She began her career at Drexel Burnham Lambert in media investment banking, followed by capital research and management, where she advised $100 billion and managed a $500 million portfolio of media stocks. That ain't too shabby. She moved to Credit Suisse First Boston in 1994 as the senior media analyst, <clears throat> where she was nationally ranked by institutional investor in successive years 1999, 2000, and 2001. In 2002, Laura moved to Paris to become executive vice president of financial strategy and investor relations for Vivendi Universal. In 2004, she founded Media Metrics LLC, publishing equity research on the largest entertainment, cable, and internet stocks in the U.S., where she was nationally ranked as, quote, best of the independent research boutiques, unquote, by institutional investor for many years. In 2009, Martin moved to Needham and Company, LLC, where she is today, and she publishes research on the largest internet and entertainment companies. For those of you who follow the markets, Laura is a uh, very welcome fixture on CNBC, Bloomberg, and all the other financial networks, where she provides insightful, incisive comments on particularly the media and telecom space. She spends, uh, sort of, uh, spends most of her time between California, Southern California, and New York and uh, with her husband and three children, three very successful and uh, ambitious and uh, high achieving children, one of whom is uh, uh, a consultant here in Washington, D.C. The other two are lawyers. Um, Laura is a, uh, we're delighted to have her. She always brings the, uh, not only the insightful analysis on the markets, but a very practical perspective that I'm sure will be of interest to many of your companies. So let's give a, please, a warm media and to welcome to Laura Martin. try something new today. I thought for the first five minutes I would tell you um, what I thought the di think the differences are between my Wall Street ecosystem, which is very insular, and the Washington, D.C. ecosystem. Then I thought I would give you the five things that I think everybody in media sort of agrees on today. And then I thought I'd give you what um, I disagree with or what I'm saying that's out of consensus view. And, I, and, and that part is going to sound really mean to you guys in your ecosystem, because we're sort of brutal on Wall Street. So that's why I sort of think it takes So I don't want you to hate me, because I'm actually doing what's normal for my ecosystem when I'm really mean about you know, dissing people. Um, and I diss them to their face, too. It's not like it's behind their back. So um, some of the things that I would say are different about Wall Street versus, so I ran a, in Aspen, I ran a, um, future of streaming. It was all regulators, Washington, D.C. It all was in T D.C. ecosystem. And I sort of learned some, some interesting things that I'd never thought through. So first of all, it's time frames. Money managed moves over 12 months. Any professionally managed money, I only call on, on the largest money managers. I don't call on any retail. Money moves within a year. If you don't beat your benchmark, money leaves you and it goes to somebody who beat the benchmark. Benchmarks are like the S&P 500 or the Russell 2000. If you don't beat your benchmark, you're fired within two years. You cannot not meet your benchmark in two years. And money moves. The other thing is, if you decide to buy Apple, you buy it now because the markets are moving. You don't wait till tomorrow because every single trade is a zero-sum game. You, if in five minutes, you know whether you're right or wrong, and you are required to pay the bill in three days. Even if your stock you bought is down 20%, or you shorted a stock, which has unlimited risk, and it's up fourfold, you owe money in three days, and you know at the end of the day, your report card. So what happens is, there's a saying in my world that says, do not mistake effort for results. When I worked in money management, I had a guy, he made one trade a month. Managing him was not managing him. Whatever he said, it's so hard to beat an in your whatever index you're paid against every year, and he'd done it for 20 years. Whatever that guy wanted, they were giving him. And he made one trade a month. So it's like, but, but by the way, he knew the price of gold at any minute of the day, the price of the 10 year, we did equities. Like none of these have to do with equities directly. He knew everything about markets, but, and he was a good money manager. 
So time frames are really different in my world. Everything's like, it's all a race against time. Um, second, how many people in this room have heard of Warren Buffett? Good. How many people have heard of um, um, Bill Miller, who's the current? OK, great. How many people have heard of, who's the famous guy from Fidelity, Priscilla? Did I write it down? Um, 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 Peter Lynch. How many people have heard of Peter Lynch? OK, that's the point. Money man, I have a brand called Laura Martin. Money manages about individuals, has nothing to do with team. If you're good in this business, you are good because it's you and you are personally identifiable, which means that you're uncontrollable. The better you get, the more asshole you become because no one can touch you. So you're sort of incented to go to that place. You're at George Soros, you've probably heard of. I mean, if you've heard of them, they are awesome money managers and they're probably assholes. <laughs> so I walked into a client my first day when I was at First Boston, my first time to Boston, and a very large money manager, I sat down, he says, you are an idiot. And I'm like, okay, yeah, probably, and why, in your point of view, he's like, because you left capital research. But that is the kind of, like, that's the first time I met him. Like, there's nothing kinder and gentler about that. You just have to go, it's so lots of sharp elbows, everything's competitive, and everything is under time pressure. So what that does, what are the... Um, one of the unintended consequences is it makes us pithy. It makes us speak in bullet points, not full sentences. And if somebody says, what's wrong with Meta, which is a synonym for Facebook these days, and I say TikTok, I can move on. That's it, no more words. So, because that's about time usage. So I would say that's, that's the difference between DC and us. Um, or Wall Street, it's all about can you get across your main point in the fewest number of words, and they don't have to actually be good grammar, they don't have to be the accurate word. You guys have a lot more respect for like the English language and diction. We don't have, you know, TikTok's the answer to what's wrong with Facebook. Done. So that's a big difference. Um, I would say um, one of the things I learned at this, and, and then if, um, if you give um, Ken the if you write me an email, I can add you to my research list because I wrote up a lot, a lot of these things. One of the most interesting learnings that um, I had in this most recent thing is we were talking about whether movie windows will come back, whether windowing, whether movie window has collapsed and will never come back. Everything's going to go straight to streaming. And I said, well, if movies don't come back, it will destroy the economics. And this adorable little 28-year-old blonde girl puts up her hand. She says, who's economics? And I said, well, companies, like the ecosystem that makes content. She goes, but not user-generated content. It's good. And that's when I realized I had this like epiphany. Wa Washington, D.C. cares about people, individuals. Wall Street starts at the public entity point of view. What is happening with the ecosystem? Where are earnings going? Because I need to value that and trade on that today. So if the movie window is gonna collapse and that's bad for everybody's content, return on content, I need to be pulling money out of the media ecosystem and putting it in healthcare, putting it in energy, putting it in Bitcoin. Like these are all different analysts, I only do media. But I have to like put holds or sells on all my stocks and say, look, this is a bad trend that we're gonna lose economics to the media ecosystem. Go put it in automated vehicles or something, leave. Um, so I would say that's a big difference, that we really don't look at the world. Similarly, um, I was talking about video games. During COVID, there was a huge shift of, of sort of 15 to 25 year old men to video games and out of streaming, out of TV watching, into streaming. Somebody in the room, again, a DC ecosystem person said, should we be transferring money to poor young men because they need to do video games? Like that's where they come at this. Like, I come at it from the corporate level, like, oh my gosh, we should buy Activision and EA. They're thinking, well, poor men can't afford these fast computers, so they can't participate in this trend that rich 20-year-olds are doing. Like, it's, it's so, it's interesting, because there's like, um, there's, there's not that much overlap there. It's, it's, so it's, like I said, it's a really interesting. The other thing that's really different, you guys, so one of the things I never realized about Wall Street, but came up again in the same meeting was, you guys ask why. We never ask why. We ask how. Like, here are your constraints. How do you make money doing that? What's the market need? How do I create a barrier to entry? What are my competitive advantages? How do I get financing? So there were two questions that came up when I was leading this Washington, D.C. panel. I never asked in my practice. One was, one was, um, why do people stream? 
I've never asked that question, I don't know. They just do, the data shows they do. Um, why do people pay, buy streaming services was a question that came up, they spent 15 minutes on this. I'm like, like, do I care about that? I don't know that I care about this, but they cared 15 minutes worth. The whole group talked about this. And is streaming ruining democracy? I'm like, that's a question I never asked either. So that's that what I say is my last big difference I would highlight between you guys, a lot of DC thinks about why something is and whether it should be like that or should you know, should we change something? Wall Street doesn't ask that question. Wall Street says how. Given the constraints, how do I move forward? How do I make money? Basically, it's a it's a simple goal. It's making money or creating barriers to entry. So I don't know if that's interesting to you guys, but I thought it was really interesting because it's new learning. So let's talk about future of media and what everyone agreed to. Not only me and my little Wall Street ecosystem, but also all the DC people. Okay, mm -hmm. so consensus views um, across both ecosystems of my fracturing audiences across more devices creates problems for advertisers who need aggregated reach, um, and it creates um, it creates more stratification among media because if you have an Apple device, you're going to be richer usually than if you have an Android de a smartphone. Um, more. Um, more screen time during COVID. Everybody agrees that during COVID, screen time went through the roof, and we have not seen a we have not seen a rebound in that. We're still getting massive screen times post COVID, much higher screen times than before COVID. Um, business models, subscription, and advertising. I would say that everybody agrees that I think now it's clear that a lot of the streaming services will will duplicate linear TV, where you have both um, street, you have both advertising, and um, subscription business models. Um, the um, $80 billion of content spend, great for consumers, Wall Street screaming and yelling at these people. Every single streaming service loses money. So no matter, if you're standalone Netflix, that's bad for you because you don't have something subsidized, but if you're running the Walt Disney Company or Paramount or Fox, um, who I know is in the room, you know, we're screaming at you to stop losing all this money because we're not in the business of funding losses. You're gonna fund losses, I'm pulling money out of your ecosystem and putting it in healthcare, right? That's what liquidity gives you. It gives you the ability to get rid of all these stocks and you've watched them all come down as their streaming losses pile up. So we want them to do one of two things. They either need to cut costs, content costs, and if you ever know, you have met a content person, they hate cutting, you know, creation budgets. Um, so either they need to cut their content costs or they need to find a new revenue stream. So a new revenue stream is adding advertising to Disney and, and Netflix, or if you're advertising only, like Crackle is advertising only, Roku channels advertising only, we're screaming and yelling and saying, no, 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 add subscription. You must have two revenue streams. The other thing about Wall Street is we always value two revenue streams more than one because a lot of portfolio theory is predicated on diversification our worst nightmare is we walk, oika, we open the Wall Street Journal, and it says new ad blocking technology will allow consumers to not see any ads. That is my worst nightmare if what I own in my portfolio is ad stocks, because they're gonna be down 30% that day. So we like subscription revenue streams because they are visible, like the cable industry, they are visible, and they give you downside protection. And we like advertising because that's 80% profit margins, and in the cycle, right now it's bad. We're, that we're going into recession, so it's bad part of the cycle. But on the upside, suddenly you get massive over delivery of earnings per share. So, and that's the only way to make money. That whatever I've projected on Wall Street, they have to over deliver that. Advertising lets you do that. Subscription does not. Subscription's visible. They, you know, cable companies, I can predict within 5% what they're gonna earn. Hard to make money on that. It's not gonna be an over delivery. But with advertising, you can be wrong by 3x on the upside of the cycle. And right now we're being wrong to the downside by 20%. So business models, we want two revenue streams for all of these streamers, just like we had in linear TV. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so another consensus view on, um, another consensus view on um, TV is linear TV. Viewing is moving to connected television and advertisers are following. It, um, let's see, um, and revenue follows, Wall Street really believes that revenue follows time. Let's see, let's see what else these guys thought. Oh, um, sort of everybody thinks that 
where advertising is going next, actually, I sort of feel this more strongly, but I think most people agree, is it's going to be linked to e-commerce. Like what Amazon does is best practice. You buy an ad, and then you can prove that the ad drove a sale. Closing that loop, that's an online loop. But I even think like offline, like we're seeing a lot of deals between like Trade Desk and Walmart or Roku and Target, where you buy an ad and then they trace into the, they do a deal with a big retailer where they can trace almost like a coupon. So you can create a return on investment for the ad. So um, to figure out if your ads are being worthwhile. So I think e-commerce and advertising are gonna have a tighter link driven by the Amazon link that we're seeing today because that is really best practice. Better search functionality. I think everybody thinks that media needs better search because you have this mass chaos of all these hours of content people are creating. You can't find it. You can't find the right thing. Personalization engines need to get better. So I'm not seeing the same thing as my husband. The problem is connected televisions are shared devices. I just came from a conference yesterday. I was speaking at a gig yesterday in LA on ABOD. And 80% of TV watching is done with at least one other person. So if they think they're targeting you, uh-oh, there's somebody sitting next to you that is that ad is irrelevant. So that's, a, that's sort of, um, it's sort of, um, anyway, so that's a, like a challenge, I guess, of CTV if it's not as targeted as a smartphone. Do you know more people, 20 year old people say they'd be more likely to share a toothbrush than their smartphone? Toothbrush. <laughs> Actually, one of the guys on stage said, when I said that, he went up to me, he goes, no, they say they'd rather give up food than their smartphone. I said, whoa, I'm not sure I'd go that far, but, but I, guess, I guess smartphones are really important utilities. Um, so let's see, growth outside the U.S. I think is a consensus view. U.S. has by far the largest ad market and the largest subscription payments, but I think that there's a consensus that all of these new technologies are globally scaled and so they're going to get revenue from offshore. Um, okay, so let's talk about what I don't agree with and what I'm saying that is controversial slash contentious and some of it's going to be mean, so I apologize, but now you know. I'm from a sharp elbows world. I'm sort of paid to be mean, frankly, with mean people. I'm paid to be mean against with mean people. So um, everybody's mean in my life. Okay, so let's see. So I think a big thing that people are missing, and again, I come from the point of view of where can I see economics moving that isn't anticipated? So I'm really looking at earnings per share or return on capital. That's my seat. My seat is if I buy a share of your stock, which helps drive down your cost of capital, which makes it cheaper for you to raise capital. What's the return you're giving me? Okay. So, um, so then I get paid to think, where are people overstating or understating? And by the way, these are $3 trillion markets. So this is the ultimate arrogance, right? There are people trading all day, every day. Stocks I cover, I cover Apple, Amazon, Meta, Alphabet, Netflix. These are the biggest stocks on earth. There's millions of people trading, and I'm like, you've got it all wrong, guys. No, no, here's what you're missing, right? So. There's a part of my job that's just insane, you know, really arrogant because there's people really putting money to work, but I advise them. So the first thing I'm saying that's different is all the, 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 the comparison of TV to streaming is too narrow, that we need to widen our gaze and look at the hours and the demographics that we're losing to video games and the hours and the demographics we're losing to user-generated content. Whether it's YouTube, right now it is TikTok, or Facebook, which is social. When I had this conversation with the uh, Aspen um, folks, they were like, what about friendship? And I'm like, what? You know, because again, I think of the world from a company point of view, but it was a DC ecosystem. So like, friendship takes time away from media. He's right, friendship takes time away from media. But the, the point is, he, again, the DC comes at it from the individual's point of view. But I come at it from what companies, you know, what we're overstating earnings in all of TV, in my opinion, if we ignore the fact that there's seepage or leakage out of all media into other forms of media. And of course, he's right. It, there's also seepage into education. What's happening right now with TikTok, which is really sort of extraordinary, is it's taking creators and it's taking viewing time out of traditional, the historical Pinterest. Twitter, Meta, um, Snap, it's taking time. Well, ad units are time times cost per thousand, right? So if you have fewer thousands, because they're over here, that's why all these guys are underperforming. These old guys, the incumbents, are underperforming their earnings. So I guess I would think of media as more holistic. 
um, within the media ecosystem, and I think even that is probably too narrow. We need to think about things even bigger, like are people going back to school? That takes more time and stuff. So I would say that's the first thing we're saying that's different. Um, I would say let's just walk through the fangs, right? The fangs are Facebook, which is now called Meta, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google, which is now called Alphabet. So, okay, um, Apple, what we're saying that's different um, is that the, uh, it is a services company that, and that advertising could double its services revenue. So Apple on its hardware does about a 30% profit margin, what's called an operating margin. Um, so the return on capital, you give them a dollar and their hardware generates 30%. Most hardware business generate 1%. They generate 30 because they're brand. However, then they sell services that has a 60% profit margin. I think adverti advertising typically has an 80% incremental profit margin. And we think in the advertising, their, their services business round numbers is 100 billion a year. And we th in the, glo the uh, global advertising ecosystem is 600 billion. So we think they could double their services revenue at a higher margin, which could drive Apple's share price higher than anybody expects. Because hardware analysts, by the way, 50 analysts on Apple, three women, all the rest are men. Most of them are hardware analysts, 40 hardware analysts. So now you try to pull them into advertising or even services, and they're like, what are you talking about? This is the hardware business. You, so that's actually a competitive advantage. If you come at some of this world from a different starting point, like we come at it from media, we can see, so we can see the value of bundled services, which is what they have, and put a value on that, that a hardware guy's like, what are you talking about? They don't work in worlds, even with 30% margins, much less 60 or 80. So, so that's what we're saying about Apple, that we think advertising could double their services revenue which would, at a higher margin, which would like, it wouldn't matter if you had a dud iPhone year. It just wouldn't matter because these new services numbers are so big. It would drive earnings per share growth, to, even if they had a bad iPhone cycle, which no one, that means you're mitigating risk. That means the risk to earnings is less because you, um, because even if you have a bad iPhone, this, you know, going into the ad business could drive upside to earnings for five years. Amazon. Uh, what basically, this is very controversial, the same thing, 50 people, I think there might be four analysts in this one, or girls, but, um, but they're all, all, 40 of them, e-commerce analysts. We're like, you're getting e-commerce for free. Let's value Twitch, which is a gaming platform. Let's value Prime, which is SVOD, subscription, streaming. Let's value the cloud, and let's value, if you look at their media assets, plus their cloud, we're arguing you're getting e-commerce for free for free because there's so much value in these other pieces and it just gets pulled down by the e-commerce multiple because e-commerce people like this trades at a big premium well that's because it's business isn't just e-commerce they've used it to leverage into things like cloud which really if you spun off 10 percent of that the cloud would be that 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 entity would trade at three times the multiple of amazon so like that's what we're saying that you're getting e-commerce for free i would it's fair to say that the e-commerce analysts disagree with me um, Google Alphabet, we hope you guys regulate them and split them up. This company, <laughs> oh my god, they had one good idea 15 years ago. It was a great idea and it was a big idea. And they make a load of money on search and then everything else is a hobby. They don't make money on anything else. And they call you and they say, well, we're gonna do this. Everything loses money. So I would love it if you broke them up because for one thing, when it broke them up or even if they had the spin-off part of it, if they had to be ancillary to the mean people, you'd be like, that's a stupid strategic decision. Why are you doing that? Like they don't have to answer to anybody in that empire because search just writes them a check at the end of the year, writes them a check for their losses. They're actually ruining the executives because nobody has to worry about return on capital. So they trade at a really, I would say, pauperish multiple for the businesses they own because they don't demand any executive make money because search just makes enough money to write a check. It's like, you know, dad. It's like, but, you know, so I hope you guys break up Google and let us come, let us yell at them and be mean to them and make them, like the subsidiaries have higher returns on capital. We have a sell on Meta, which is Facebook. Um, what we're saying there that's very controversial, so Meta has, uh, 50 analysts, synonym for Facebook as a company, um, has 50 analysts, maybe 45 actually, um, two sells, two holds, 45 buys. Do you know how hard it is to make money if you have a consensus like that? It's impossible. Everybody's already priced in a buy, so not us. We're like, 
we think Meta has existential threats, which is code for we think they might go out of business. That is a controversial thing to say. Existential threat, that's code for might go out of business. So what we're arguing is A, Mark, so the CEO of Meta is saying he's gonna invest 10 billion last year and 20 billion this year in this thing called the Metaverse, which he has a definition that no one else does of the Metaverse, okay? And it's gonna hopefully pay off in 2030. So I say, what value is liquidity? Why am I waiting around? We should sell Meta, put the, put the money in something that just finished an investment cycle, make money for nine years, and then we'll look around and see if really, A, he made progress, B, whether his definition of the metaverse is actually the one that's gonna win, and whether he's successfully executed. Like, why are we sitting around in this stock if the payoff for 10 and 20 billion a year is coming in 2030? Most investment time frames, as I told you, 12 to 24 months, because that's when you get fired. 2030, beyond any investor's time frame. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing is, at the same time, he's spending enormous amounts of money taking margin pressure, investing in something that pays off in 2030. He's saying, I have to push my two billion viewers a month towards something called Reels, which is short form video, which is a tick knockoff of TikTok, right? Because TikTok's stealing so much share from them. And you say to yourself, well, if you're trying to spend money here, why are you on purpose pushing people out of newsfeed, which has a much higher return on capital, a much higher return on time, into Reels, unless you feel you don't have a core business, unless you get back those 90 million people that are now on TikTok. Like, why would you do both at the same time? You would maximize your revenue so that you can then afford this metaverse build out, unless you felt that you didn't have a core business. Otherwise, why would you do them at the same time? So that's what we're arguing. We're arguing that he is, that we're listening, and what he's telling us is that his core business is not sustainable unless he gets these 90 million people back from TikTok. Yes, ma'am. Can I ask one question? Of course. I have so many friends who go to Facebook money that are quitting. And the reason they're quitting is because he has now said, and I put in my daily single today, quit today, um, that if they just bring in the money, but now what he's doing is he's saying that we're going to put metrics on it. And so to see what kind of performance you are. So mm -hmm. they're, they're, um, their morale is so low. Yeah. I agree. I don't disagree with anything. So said. really good people are leaving. My friends all over the country are leaving today. They're best, they have so many cell phones. So that is part of the corporate culture too. I don't know if it's why it's quitting me. stocks in media is down pick a number 50 to 70 percent you are incented if you are an economic person to leave your money your money's underwater all your options are 70 percent up which means you're working for the next three years for free or until that stock gets back above where it was a year ago way better you walk out the door you go across the street to google they give you options at current prices which are also down 50 percent but now you're no longer working for so no one should actually, if they're just economic, uh, if they're just economically motivated, no one should be sitting in their seat if they're a computer engineer. Anybody at a media company that has skills that are transferable, and everybody at Facebook, Google, Amazon, their skills are Microsoft, their skills are transferable, you can move, they should all move. Because they then get shares in the new company 50% lower, so they're gonna benefit from the bounce when we get off. So if, if, if you then have couple that, economic motivation with bad culture, bad morale, you just get accelerated leaving. But it's in everybody's economic interest right now in these Silicon Valley companies to leave. It makes no sense to stay economically, because for three years you're working for free. None of your, none of your options that you've been granted will be in the money for three more years. So most people don't actually work for money, but, but that was the smart economic trade. Um, okay, let's do, so that's my, what I'm saying on, um, and then Netflix is the and in things. Um, so Netflix, we've been negative for a long time. Um, 
this is sort of inside baseball, so let me just try to keep it interesting. Um, so Netflix, our point of view is that. Um, so um, what I would say about Netflix that we're worried about, we had a sell on that one and then we upgraded to a hold, but I would say we're negative on this one too a little bit, is um, so one of the, I would say, a chronic condition of the Silicon Valley is not invented here. Like if we didn't invent it, it's, it's just too old, like you don't get it. Like that's their tagline, we, you don't get it, right? Because somebody invented it 50 years ago. Okay, so they invented the streaming space. Yay, full credit to them, they're geniuses. The problem is they've got a corporate culture that's really competitive, um, and what that means is they don't like reversing themselves, right? So Reed Hastings didn't have ads for way too long until Disney, which was the very last SVOD service, subscription service to have ads, he didn't have ads. And then he came out on some call in the Q&A and said, yeah, yeah, we're gonna have to add ads. Consumers need choice, right? And then they hired two guys from Snap. I don't know if you guys know, and you probably know of you have Snap, but Snap is an ad that's a vertical screen on a small device. It has nothing to do with connected TV. 100% of Netflix ads are connected television, which is sideways and 50 inches. By definition, a connected television ad has to be a 50 inch screen or bigger. So he just hired, they hired two people from Snap, and then they hired Microsoft. The week before, when Netflix had said, um, we're gonna go in the ad business, I was at the IAB, which is a big industry organization that does great measurement in digital. And we had had, um, we broke up into groups, no one mentioned Microsoft as a potential partner for their SSP, for their, for their ad tech partner, no one. And that was a room of experts. So my opinion is either it was the stupidest thing ever, or Netflix is trying to get bought by Microsoft. That's the only smart play here. If he thinks he can't go it alone, which is what we're writing, we think you must be bundled, you must be able to do what the Walt Disney Company is doing, which is create a bundle across all services. You're our streaming company, we give you a discount at the parks, we give you a discount on merch. You go to the parks, we're gonna give you three free months of streaming. They're gonna bundle all of those assets together into like Apple One. You know how Apple One has a bundle of services? There's gonna be a Disney one. I don't know what they're gonna call it. They never copy somebody else. They'll invent something, everybody will copy them and what they call it. Everybody needs to be bundled. Netflix, no bundle. They're a pure price streamer. That means they need to be bundled with somebody. They need a big deep pocket that can continue to fund these losses. And $17 billion a year on content. They either have to cut their content spend, like I said, content people don't like to cut, or they need to get a bit deeper pocket. Microsoft could be a deeper pocket. But as an advertising partner, worst idea ever. So um, anyway, so it's not optimistic there, and really, the, that's a culture. Facebook did it by accident. This is a corporate culture that I think needs to die, actually. Sorry to be mean. It, this corporate <laughs> culture is horrendous, I think. Um, OK. Um, winners and losers in media. I think, um, I think YouTube's a clear winner. We're saying $30 billion this year in ad revenue. Let's call it AVOD, or you know, I, I would say they're a clear winner. Um, I would like them to be separated from Google because I think they could do a lot. I think this 30 in the hands of a competent advertising person could be 60. Like that's how bad it is. And they're still losing money. They're making 30 billion a year, they're still losing money. And Search writes them a check. That's ridiculous. Like they shouldn't have this cost structure, in my opinion. Um, the Disney bundle wins because bundle, they have deep pockets, they've got best in class brands. You know, I, I don't know how good their content is, but I know they have marketing excellence. So they're not gonna get the marketing wrong. Um, and so I think they went, and I think the Amazon Prime bundle. So let's remember, Amazon and Apple never need to make money with streaming, right? They have other objectives. So Amazon Prime can lose money on streaming. How would I notice? Like, the, the company's huge. It could lose, I think, I think Netflix is gonna lose $4 billion this year. It's gonna spend 17 in the current year, get back 13, so lose in the current period for Billion, but you know they get money next year from the same content, so it doesn't matter if you lose it. But anyway, Amazon doesn't like you don't notice, and Apple, who's sort of not done a very good job so far competing, makes ninety billion dollars a year. What free a free cash flow a year? What that means is they can mess it up as long as they want, and when you have free cash flow, you have a forever option to decide to spend it on something later. Free cash flow buys optionality, buys time. So with Apple, if they went and spent 15 billion on content, no one would notice. They generate so much free cash flow. 
So they haven't decided streaming's big enough for them, or they need to play there. They bought some soccer rights. They're toying with. Um, but so I would say Apple's a dark horse. It hasn't decided that media is interesting to them. You know, they think of themselves more as a utility. Um, but if they come into this business, you actually can't win. Yes, ma'am. I have one more question. Okay, so I think it's your focus. I subset of irrelevant data today. The reason that Fox has higher ratings and the numbers you just gave is because the average age of Fox News is 72, and that's who has linear TV, and that's what Nielsen so measures. CNN. CNN. But, but, but that's why the numbers don't. The number, but that's the answer to your question. Demos, they're lower than CNN. No. CNN's demos are lower than no. My point would be you're not looking at measurements on streaming. The, when a kid's, kids are not, kids under 40 My kids aren't linear TV. Standard. Okay, the average, the average engagement time on a streaming platform once you turn in the news is 45 minutes. And that goes for local broadcast, if you're streaming local broadcast, 45 minutes is the average time on news. If once they engage, yes, some kids don't watch it at all, they just get it from there, but it is not fair to just look at the linear TV ecosystem as measured by Nielsen and make any conclusions from it. It is too narrow, it is too antiquated, and those people are dying, they are not the future. <laughs> Again, sorry. <laughs> um, in your world, do you think about regulation, regulatory risks at all when you, when you um, come to do looking at and doing analysis on, on any given stock? You know, sort of yes and no. It's you know, you guys, you guys. Um, I think all of us understand that for excellence in our it's economics, and that you guys do laws. So I think it's really hard to feel like we have better knowledge about regulatory, and it's usually long term. If you're gonna get fired every year or two if you don't outperform, it's almost like you can't really make a trade on something that might happen in the regulatory footprint by this November or by next November. I mean, you can make a little bet going into November what you think happened, but if it doesn't play out, you're gonna sell right after. You're gonna make a trade on the regulatory, It'd be hard to invest on regulatory because it's uncertain. We are not lawyers. Um, we don't have the attention span you guys have. Right. You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's not three bullet points. This regulatory stuff is hard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, tell me, and is it in the next week? You know, so I would say some of the things that make us different, it's really hard to take regulatory into account because even if you're right on the call, like Facebook is gonna face more regulatory scrutiny okay, over what time period, what form does that take, when does it hurt economics, because everything comes back to me to earnings per share, and are you over or under delivering? It's really tough. I mean, regulatory doesn't really move that fast. Yes, ma'am. If our merger approvals are stepping to that role, would you all? So like the FTC telling Facebook it has to pre-approve? Yeah, so we wrote a negative note on that. You can't really run a business if you have to run anything by the government because they're gonna leak it. You guys like sieves here, right? <laughs> you know, in my world, information is not it is power. So I whisper it to you, but you don't. You then trade on it, but you don't do it. <laughs> but in your world, you guys all trade information. So, so if you need, so it is negative because it's really somebody 
try to execute that, not only could Facebook not buy anything, but the minute they asked you for permission, you would leak it, the stock of what they want to buy was all 2x, they can't buy it anyway. So it all becomes, they can never buy something else, I would say. So I would say in that way, yeah. Yes, sir? Uh, jumping off on mergers, so yeah. um, the young consumer is producing this all on streaming. Yeah. So Max or Discovery merger has been in the average consumer's view in complete chaos. Uh, what Wait, is say it? that uh, the, again? The HBO Max or Discovery merger yeah. uh, is to an average consumer has seemed very chaotic. Does that change? understand you guys come at it from the individual yeah. point of view. So I'm going to talk to you from my side, which is from the corporate point of view. Um, anyone in this room can ask anything? I think they say something, <laughs> they say something really mean. I need to apologize to them first. I think at t is arguably the worst managed company right now in today's, like AOL used to be, at t is that company today. Worst managed company ever. They lost a lot of Warner Brothers talent. They were really bad at this. And now they're in the hands of competent execution guys, which means you can lay off a lot of people. That's what competent means. David Zaslav is best in class people people. He was also no bullshit. You don't pull your weight, you're out. Okay? And then you got John Malone on the board. I don't know that there's a better strategist, proven economic strategist in media than John Malone. And he's on the board. He gave up his AD, his super bogey shares in Discovery to do this deal. Because AT&T insisted. So you have the best thinker and the best execution guy, and this guy, the CFO, chief financial officer, and really I think that job is about saying no to everyone about everything. He is best in class. So when they bought scripts, they guaranteed the street, I'm gonna forget, $2 billion across saving TV sticks. Here he's, the CFO is guaranteed five billion, he'll give you 10, maybe 15. Over five years, right? They've, I think they've guaranteed five in two years. I think he'll do 10 or 15. He is best in class as CFO. So I think you're gonna end up with a more well-managed, clear, I mean, basically it's like John Malone thinks of something genius, David Zaslav goes and executes it, and the CFO figures out how to do it with better systems, better controls, fewer, fewer layers. So I'm not sure Warner Brothers has ever really had that, but they've just lost so many people because of AT&T. Monopoly should not buy things. Mm -hmm. Anyway. That, that's my opinion. I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be a great stock. I think it's going to have upside. And um, I, I would much rather be uh, managed by David Zaslav than anybody except Bob Iger, who's now gone from Disney, so you can't be managed by him anymore. So in Hollywood today, the guy I would want to work for if I was a creative person is David Zaslav, who runs that empire. Yes, ma'am? What's the future of the broadcast station? So um, what we're hearing from the platform, so this would be taught, I cover Vizio, I cover Roku, I good friends with the guys at LG and Samsung. I would say there is a renewed understanding they must have your local streaming assets. That to get streamers in local markets, the broadcaster, they really need that local, they need it on the streaming platform, they need it IP delivered, not over the air. Um, but they really need local, content in each of the demos that they have. So it's my point of view that that will bring with it negotiating leverage because that content is, I would call it unique. Or So um, I don't know what the economics are today. Uh, probably they're like normal economics where the platform gets two minutes and you guys keep the other minutes. But I would say um, local will continue because it is unique content proprietary to local station will continue to have value in the um, streaming ecosystem, in the streaming, in the shift to streaming. And what is it besides news that is local? It's definitely news. I think, I think like scripts, I might be wrong about this because this is, I don't cover broadcast anymore, but, um, but they're doing stuff with their extra spectrum, like they're doing like Newsy where they're aggregating. Like if you use your extra spectrum to create content and then you move it to streaming, it gives you pricing power. I don't think I don't think things that are commoditized, like if you're talking about your network run, if you're a Fox affiliate or an or an ABC affiliate, and that's um, not unique to you, I think that comes to that price of power. But I think your I think your unique content is um, will have price of power in your local. That's what I think. I, I 
I guess what I would say is, look, your excellence is your local content. So maybe you have to do more local content because that is what is proprietary to you. Somebody in national content, they can get it from 200 markets. So you are pretty good by saying that. Yes, sir. Um, well, what's going to be the point where companies just say, the streaming platform is losing too much money, I'm going to give up on it and you know sell my content to another platform? And also, somewhat related to that, um, not that I would ever do such a thing, but a lot of people need sharing, you know, maybe like 50 plus passwords for, um, you know, for Amazon Prime. I mean, again, I would never do this. Um, why has that not been cracked down? Like, so Netflix just kind of came out and said they're going to start um, ending this practice. Why have another streaming platform done the same? Okay, so let's answer the first question first, which is, I think, really an interesting question. So the answer is it doesn't play out like that. Okay. Consumers have told you through their viewing out through their engagement metrics that they like the streaming, they like on demand, they fast channels, which are basically linear channels, similar, but they're all murder, she wrote one after another, or they're the age of channels, <laughs> super niche. Um, they've told you they want to be on streaming platforms, not linear TV, probably because of the price, but whatever the reason is, maybe the ad loads, whatever. Uh, they want to be on streaming platforms, which means those survive, because the consumer demands it. The consumer says, I want to be on streaming. Okay. So the questions Wall Street's asking is how long does linear survive? Not your question, like when the streaming shut down, doesn't shut down. What happens in real life is as Wall Street takes these values down, which takes their cost of capital up, they have to consolidate. Because I just told you, David Zaslav just bought, sorry, Discovery just bought Warner. They'll cut billions of dollars out of the cost because you don't need two CFOs, you don't need two IR people, you don't need to. You need fewer people, so bigger. So what happens is the reason we have big companies that survive in media is there's no competitive advantage of being larger in media. Bigger libraries, more pricing power, more bundles, bigger bundles, sister subsidiaries that give you an option because they have free cash flow. Parks are on fire right now. It's both Comcast, which is a universal parks entity, on fire. I've never seen profit margins this high in 30 years of covering the Walt Disney Company. All that money is going into streaming. Okay. We're marking down their multiple. We don't like that use, but they're not going out of business. Like I said, free cash flow by optionality of time. So what happens next is we get one minute. We get consolidation into bigger entities, and they cut the hell out of costs. That's what happens next. Streaming does not go away. Linear might might go away. Streaming does not go away. And your other question was password sharing. <sighs> Look, password sharing was the exact same thing as. We were being really mean to Reed, because we're not just like mean, mean. We're like mean to the CEOs. We're like, hey, buddy, you're losing subs. What the fuck? Um, and by the way, when they, they were down 30%, they took the whole streaming space down 20%. Because if Netflix can't grow, that means the whole streaming industry is a smaller, total addressable market than we all thought. Like, it took everybody down when Netflix missed their number. So we were yelling, we're like, what the heck? What are you gonna do? How do you get growth back? Capital, capitalism requires growth. So Reed, how do you get growth back? Um, and it was, it, was, it was brutal. I mean, it was, you would not want to be Reed Hastings on that call. <laughs> and so he's like, well, we're gonna have to do ads. That helps us stop revenue. And he says, and we're gonna crack down on password sharing. That's literally what it was. It's like, he's reacting to us screaming at him. <laughs> meaner and meaner. <laughs> You know, you know, CEOs started to sign up to be visionaries, and, and I'm going to call it nice guys, and they love people. That's none of our thing. Our thing is, I'm giving you a dollar, what's your return this week? And what do you mean you geek? It's not what you told me last week. So, and we hadn't stumbled that much, so that's sort of bad, because when a CEO doesn't stumble for seven years, and now we stumble, people are meaner. They feel like they feel like they got betrayed. Like you, they put all this trust in you, and now you didn't. Like it becomes personal, sort of. Because people are losing real money. I mean, yeah. Anyway, so it becomes a little more personal because we did not miss people or not very fast. Um, so anyway, so I would say, um, I would say that um, uh, password sharing, I think, is enough. It's just inconsequential. So much. Yes, ma'am. Um, what happens to the smaller ones, the Hulu, the, the Peacock, the Paramount Plus? Do they disappear? Do they, no, luckily E20, you just mentioned, is owned by a big guy. So Hulu's owned by the Walt Disney Company. Uh, they're gonna buy, they have to buy our Comcast, which is this big argument they're having in the press right now. Brian Robert says he wants to buy Hulu. 
Disney says, no, we own two thirds, we want to buy a Comcast third. It will be owned by one of these big, what we call it, media giants. Oh, that's me in the back to order my Uber. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, so they're owned by these really big companies, and, and every, Peacock is owned by Comcast, and they're all big, deep pocketed. I do think we're saying that the winners, you know, that French have that saying, the more things change, the more they stay the same. We think the people who win are the people who started here on Food Network, who created the industry. Because who owns IP and whose library is, um, are the big media companies. I'm just gonna order my Google and see if they buy it from this. And then I'm going to write in the article like this. Pop, 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 put me in the station, give me the delay. Then I'll order it in three minutes. <laughs> who else, who else? Yes, ma'am. I'm gonna ask a DC question. Please. Um, if I read you correctly, uh, you said that the um, United States has more advertising or more diversity in advertising than the rest of the world. Why? Um, I think we're just capitalism. I think capitalism tells, sort of answers the question of how. Given I have five competitors for shampoo, how do I make the shampoo and how do I market it that you know, is a price competitor or is a brand premium. And I think that kind of marketing excellence comes from capitalism. And marketing in part is advertising. You know, it's tough giving your message in a, it used to be one to many, and now that's having to shift to being more personalized. But I think we really, I think capitalism really locks down on finding these products. I mean, my favorite thing to do when I come back from offshore is walk down the salad dressing. Who needs 250 salad dressing other than capitalism, you know? So I think that's why. I think capitalism allows a lot of product differentiation and segmentation, but to tell people you exist if you happen to be gluten-free or vegan or, or kosher, they have to tell you that message. So they used to have to sell it to you on TV, which means there's a lot of wastage that it's not, not any of those things, but now they can do it part of it. They can, and so I, I think that's why. But it's like three times higher. Three times higher per capita advertising revenue per person here, or spending, advertising spending is how they would quantify it here. Um, and, and part of that is we're 30% of the GDP of the world. Like we're 5% of the population, and I think it's maybe 25% of total GDP. So part of it is that. You know, we're really productive, and we use our money to the our economy as consumer spending. It's advertising to spend more money, you know. Yeah, yes, yes, so, so, yep. so Earlier you told me I'm gonna die, which I got. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, what do you mean? No, it's good you gave me a lease on life because I have a bunch of teeth. So how much longer do I have to live? <laughs> so. Give me eight years, I'm good. Okay. Well, she's <laughs> ten. Well, she's My projected is ten. You can take the under. Good. 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 Positions itself differently than the other places, yes. right? And mm -hmm. so, thoughts on that? I think it's a fair question. I think Wall Street hates it. Yeah. I think Wall Street hates it. I think it doesn't love your CEO because he's inherited wealth. Um, um, we used to cover it. We don't even cover it anymore. And so I don't know how you feel about the difference, but more coverage <laughs> is better and less coverage is not. Um, you know, I don't know who buys it. You know, I, so I don't see an exit there. I don't know. I, you know, I would say sort of, sorry, it's going to hurt your feelings. Irrelevant. That's what I'd say. I can hide the corn with you. Yeah. That's right. I, I think political season every three years. Is good. Exactly. And Fox right. News is really right. doing great. Right. You know, it's, it's really, I mean, you have really great assets there. It's just small, and it doesn't do a lot of streaming because it's just because it's sold those assets company and I think that's where the key is on Wall Street is what's growing. Um, so I just don't think it's in the dialogue anymore. And frankly Peacock isn't either. It's owned by Comcast and it should be in the dialogue. It's just a streaming company. So there's lots of things not in the dialogue of, of impact. So sorry. Anything else? Last question before I run for Kay? Yes sir. So I work for Paramount. Okay. And I feel like you're swimming in Paramount. All right. <laughs> 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 How do we win? And if the answer is a lack of scale, does discovery have enough scale effort? Um, so I think Paramount gets by. You guys have big, deep libraries. I don't think it will. Wall Street really, really doesn't like their CEO. And they like Jerry the most, I guess, as well. And I, I actually think it's unfair on Fox. 
Sherry, I don't know what you're doing with your son. Anyway, look, I don't know what that was. But um, uh, so too small, too small to compete, doesn't have a big enough bundle to bundle, but very valuable IP, deep library. And whenever two studios um, merge, you get to cut out half of the film slate and only keep the best. So like Paramount, you guys have, is it, yeah, yeah, is it right now you're on fire from a digital tunnel at a time briefly. So um, I would say you guys have IP, you will get bought. And the, it's, I think they're trading at 12 billion, which is a third of what CBS alone is trading at. So someone can pay you a 50% premium and the minute they shut down half of their film library slate and yours, basically pay it off in a year, year and a half. So, but Sherry has to be willing to sell. She controls absolutely. And she loves the seat. It's a shitty reason to run a company. It's a shitty reason to run a company. But it is what it is. That's why it's having value. Okay. Laura, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.